Okay, well, uh, I want to thank the conference organizers and Weena and um, for inviting me. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, uh, but I'm there in spirit. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the Hubble tension and new data from the James Webb Space Telescope, which is weighing in on this. Um, this is work from the SHOES collaboration uh, and is contained in a couple of papers that are just recently uh, in the AppJ letters uh, listed below, and my collaborators uh, who have contributed to this uh, are listed uh, below as well. Okay, so uh, I know this is a big change in direction from uh, high redshift galaxies, so let me just set the scene a little bit. Um, what is the Hubble tension? Well, uh, we start out with the standard cosmological model, lambda CDM, that is largely a phenomenological model. It's built from basic observations about the universe that at early times, gravity uh, forms large scale structures and galaxies through attractive uh, pull of matter. And yet in more recent times, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So therefore we conclude there's a dark matter dominated phase at early times and a dark energy dominated phase at late times. But uh, we don't really understand this model in any great detail. The dark matter and dark energy uh, yet to have a really deep and fundamental explanation or detection, uh, in, particularly in the case of dark energy. I think we're actually quite baffled to uh, explain uh, dark energy at a fundamental level from the physics that we have. So therefore, it's very important, really crucial to do an end-to-end -end test of this cosmological model. And predicting and measuring the value of the Hubble constant is probably the only end-to-end -end test that we can do. And so the way this test goes is we take the most precise measurements from the early state of the universe, shortly after the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background, shown here the Planck data, which is the uh, really exquisite data uh, for measuring this. And we compare, uh, as the model predicts, the physical fluctuations in the early time plasma of the universe. We compare those to the angular distribution of those fluctuations. And in that comparison, we vary six free parameters in the model to get a good match for the power spectrum. And so uh, this, of course, assumes that we have the right model. And then once the model is calibrated, it predicts the uh, expansion history of the universe over its whole life, all the way to predict what the value of the expansion rate or the Hubble constant should be today. So as I said, a powerful end-to-end -end test of this whole story is then to directly measure the Hubble constant following its definition by measuring distances and redshifts in the local universe. So the work I'm going to talk about is based on doing that with a three-rung distance ladder that uses sort of the gold standards of distance measurements. Geometry, which can be parallaxes or the use of detached eclipsing binaries or Keplerian motion of masers in a nearby galaxy, NGC 4258, used to calibrate Cepheid variables. Uh, and those are then seen in the hosts of nearby recent type 1a supernovae and then type 1a supernovae all the way out into the expansion of the universe. Now, we've been working on this for about 15 or 20 years now. This is a generation two experiment to measure the Hubble constant, uh, primarily with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, now, more than a thousand orbits uh, and two JWST programs expended on this. Uh, the measurements have really improved over the last decade or so through the use of HST to cancel flux calibration errors along the distance ladder, the use of near infrared measurements to mitigate dust using best quality supernova data, uh, a really exhaustive set of variants of the analysis and error propagation, public release of the data. We've now calibrated 42 type 1a supernovae with three independent geometric calibrations. Uh, and this is a kind of thumbnail sketch of the distance ladder. Uh, and I would call this data release five at this point. Uh, we've been at this for quite a while, uh, growing this data set. Um, so uh, you may have heard that the uh, two approaches don't agree that well, and that that is certainly the case. Uh, our baseline fit at this point is about 73 plus or minus one including systematic uncertainties. And this sits uh, at least five sigma from the Planck plus lambda CDM value. If you include recent updates, the Gaia cluster Cepheid measurements, that would be 5.3 sigma or 
uh, more recent type 1a supernova spectral matching even up to 5.7 sigma um, and so this is really quite confounding um, now we've gone over an exhaustive set of analyses variants in 12 different categories all kinds of different ways of analyzing the data that people have suggested over the last decade or so different cuts different subsets of data leaving out certain parts of data considering alternatives and the bottom line is it's very difficult for us to get below about 72 and a half or to really get above about 73 and a half and we propagate additional systematic uncertainty due to uh, these variants in the analysis so this uh, what has arisen over the last decade is Hubble tension between early time measurements and late time measurements of the universe. It's not just uh, the experiment that I was describing or Planck. It's whenever you uh, bifurcate measurements based on whether they originate from the early universe or from the late universe, uh, you find this as you replace uh, different distance indicators or cosmic microwave background data sets. Uh, you see this repeatedly. Um, there was a nice recent annual reviews article by Lee Chiverde and collaborators uh, that gave another take on this that shows the, the problem as well, that we see a consistent inconsistency between the early universe and the late universe. So uh, if it's not an error, uh, then it's probably due to new physics in the universe, which of course would be incredibly exciting. And so therefore the, the stakes are high. And so we've gone through over the last decade uh, a list of sort of preferred possible explanations. And we've really ruled these out by a series of additional tests or experiments. I don't have time to go through this whole top 10 list, but there's a QR code link you can hit there uh, that takes you to a spreadsheet and you can study the answers to these. I'm going to focus on number 10, near-infrared Cepheid crowding. And that's because JWST can really address this. And it's one of the most... Uh, interesting, uh, I think, uh, systematics to consider. So what am I talking about? Well, when we look at Cepheid variables in distant galaxies, type 1a supernova hosts, uh, at the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope in the near infrared, where we go to reduce the effects of dust, um, we see a fair bit of crowding or blending. That is the superposition of the uh, point spread function of the Cepheid on top of other nearby stars. Um, now, I would say this is not a systematic uncertainty because we can account for this by adding fake stars into the images and figuring out what the net background or effect of this is. However, this is the dominant source of noise in the measurement of the Hubble constant um, and the distance ladder. And so by having the resolution of JWST, we can absolutely separate the Cepheids individually from the objects around them and reduce this noise. And so over cycles one and two, we have a program to reobserve the hosts of uh, uh, 16 type 1a supernovae, uh, reobserve the Cepheids with uh, NIRCAM. And so we began this program uh, in the beginning of last year with our first observations first of NGC 4258, which is the uh, first step on the distance ladder because there's a geometric distance to it. And then here showing NGC 5584 and showing you the location of known Cepheids in these galaxies. And then from this past summer, uh, four more galaxies, NGC 1448, 1559, 5468, 5643. And just this last week, uh, NGC 3147 and more observations of NGC 4258. So we're definitely rolling along at this point. Uh, here are color magnitude diagrams for each of these galaxies we've observed so far. And the uh, the little diamond, uh, sorry, the little cyan stars here show you the positions of the Cepheids. Uh, they're, of course, yellow stars. They live in the instability strip. They're uh, shown here is hiding out between the red giant branch and uh, bluer, more massive stars. Uh, and here are postage stamps of Cepheids uh, in each of these galaxies now shown uh, as observed in the optical from HST in the near infrared from JWST and also as we saw them last with HST in the near infrared. And this is what I really want to focus on is just comparing uh, JWST and HST at the same wavelength and really pretty much the same filter 
Um, so you're seeing uh, the same scenes, but at much, much higher resolution with JWST. And this is really a dramatic improvement in our ability to measure really precise photometry of these Cepheid variables. And this is really the crux of what I'm going to talk about uh, now going forward is the improvement in the precision. Um, now, we observed the Cepheids twice with JWST separated by several weeks. Why do we observe them twice? Well, it allows us to look at the variation in the brightness of the Cepheids with JWST. So what I'm showing you here on the left is the difference in brightness of the Cepheids as a function of their log period. Um, in gray is a kind of simulation just based on random light curve sampling. And in red is what we actually observe. And so what you see is this allows us to recover the phase of the Cepheid because as shown here on the right, depending on the phase of the Cepheid, whether we're observing it on the long, slow decline or the fast rise, uh, it will show up in a different place in this uh, delta magnitude space, allows us to uh, determine that phase and recover even better the mean magnitude. So just jumping to the sort of final results here, for NGC 4258 and five other galaxies that hosted eight type 1a supernovae, here are the period luminosity relations for these Cepheids. In gray are the points that we had from the Hubble Space Telescope, and in red are the points from JWST. And it's really a dramatic improvement in data quality. Uh, it's a reduction in noise or scatter by a factor of two and a half. And I'm showing you here some postage stamps now of Cepheids in each of these galaxies. Again, just to remind you of why are we getting such a great improvement? And it's really the reduction in noise because we're able to more precisely measure uh, the brightness of the Cepheid variable because they're they're basically alone in the near cam images. So, you know, again, a really dramatic improvement. Um, However, when it comes to the Hubble tension, it does not change the story. Really, it's reaffirmed it. And that's because the distances we get as measured with JWST here on the x-axis and HST on the y-axis are in very good agreement. Uh, on the bottom, I'm showing the residuals in a couple of different bandpass systems. And you can see the agreement is very good. Um, what would this have looked like if uh, we found that there was a problem with the Hubble Space Telescope measurements that solved the Hubble tension? Well, the data would presumably follow a line very much like this. As we went beyond NGC 4258, if we were systematically misestimating the brightness of Cepheids at HST resolution, and if that became enough to solve the Hubble tension, that is the difference between H naught of 73 and 67.5, which is about 0.17 magnitudes at the mean of the sample. So I've drawn a line from NGC 4258, where presumably the effect would grow to reach the mean at the mean of our sample. We can rule out that story at about 8.3 sigma. Uh, in other words, our confidence that this is not a problem in Hubble Space Telescope data is even greater than our confidence in the, the Hubble tension itself. Um, just in the last couple minutes here, I want to point out that there are other distance indicators one can measure in the exact same images with JWST, and so we've been working on that as well. Uh, in the color magnitude diagram in the near infrared, there are two population-based distance indicators, uh, tip of the red giant branch shown here, and a, a newer indicator called JGB. This is a carbon-rich AGB stars that have this kind of cloud you see over here. And those are basically both seen in different parts of the image. In the disk, you get the Cepheids. In the outer disk, you get the JAGB, AGB stars. And in the sort of halo, even further out, you get tip of the red giant branch. A uh, paper by Gagan Deep Anand that was just accepted for FJ uh, has remeasured galaxies with the tip of the red giant branch uh, measurement uh, technique that agree very well with uh, Cepheid variables. And uh, Sean Lee, who's a graduate student working with me, has uh, measured JAGB in these galaxies as well. This is on the archive and uh, also uh, in the app J. Uh, and uh, these are also very consistent with uh, Cepheids. So where are we? Well, I'm at my conclusion. So uh, where I am is uh, that uh, this discrepancy of the Hubble tension, it's lasted now at least 10 years. It's 
you know, it's at least five sigma, uh, you know, a very uh, uh, interesting way to look at this is just simply that there are many precise late universe measurements, and they all come in on one side relative to the early universe measurements. So I think this is a very robust uh, conclusion at this point. Uh, going through really an exhaustive study of systematics, variations, uh, looking at uh, internal errors, we see no evidence of excess noise. Uh, but what JWST has really done is, I think, really put this sort of nail in the coffin of, uh, you know, any alternative uh, way out of this problem by systematic errors in Hubble Space Telescope measurements, because the JWST data is just so darn good uh, that there's really no way I see around this. Uh, I think it's a really great puzzle. I mean, we're fortunate in cosmology to have such interesting questions to work on. Uh, and the potential for uh, discovery space with uh, JWST. Uh, and so, uh, you know, people often ask me, is there something missing in Lambda CDM? I'm pretty confident there is something missing in Lambda CDM. Um, what we're seeing may be evidence of that, uh, may be evidence of new physics. This has become a very hot topic, of course, in the theoretical community as well. Um, so I will end there, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have.